we run the whole business because they're in some other hymnal. Thank you. Every believer is a priest, and every believer priest has the privilege of personally and privately preparing himself for the study of the Word of God, using rebound if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Now, thank you, loving Father, for the fantastic grace which is available to us to make us into all that you would have us to be. May God the Holy Spirit glorify God the Son as we study together and help believers to make the choices which are necessary for their spiritual advance. In Jesus' name, amen. And we'll get a better transparency made, but it's helpful for me to work off of this transparency so you have a copy of it already if you don't there are other copies in the back everyone has his own copy of this and we have multitudes of these available we will be giving out more and more and more so be sure you have your copy you'll, you'll want to keep it and uh, make notes on it as we go along but from the this is we're talking about paterology God the Father from the source of his sovereignty, his love, and his omniscience, which we have studied now in detail, has come a portfolio of invisible assets. The portfolio sim analogy simply comes from the fact that uh, today, if uh, your banker has your portfolio, it contains all of the assets that you have available, whether they be stocks or bonds, uh, other investments, real estate, whatever it is, it's your portfolio of visible assets, the visible assets which belong to you, and they are kept in your portfolio. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes people will say, well, uh, he has, he's a millionaire, but he can't touch any of his money. Well, some of it's because it's in certain other forms. It's, it's in this portfolio, but he can't touch it until it is changed into liquid assets. Now, our case, we have the situation in which from the portfolio of, of invisible assets God has provided two primary assets the first is your escrow asset now we'll get uh, to it again but to, we've already talked about the escrow assets are all of the blessings that are beyond human concept that are beyond thinking beyond imagination things which are infinitely more than you could ask or imagine that God has designed in eternity past for you because he created you he knows all about you he knows what will make you happy he knows what what uh, what he can do for you and this is what he has provided in his escrow assets now his desire is uh, uh, and provision are given in the primary assets if God wants to give something wonderful to you, he has to dis determine uh, the, how to do it. And we come to election and predestination. Election is God's desire for you. Predestination is his provision for you to reach that desire. In his desire, in his election... He makes sure that every believer has equal privilege and equal opportunity, both regarding the desire or his will and his provision, you see. For example, God desires that every believer, regardless of who he is, uh, uh, would have equal privilege. And the equal privilege means that every believer is a priest, and every believer priest 
is, has the privilege of personally and privately uh, approaching God without any intermediary. This is a privilege which is unique to this dispensation. It is a glorious and wonderful privilege that God has made available to you. And uh, from, his, uh, from the equal privilege, uh, uh, along with the equal privilege, is the equal opportunity. And the equal opportunity that comes from His will, purpose, plan, and design for your, the best in your life is the provision of logistical grace, which doesn't require anything on your part except to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and He'll pour out His grace blessings upon you. Now, with that equal privilege and equal opportunity of election, God says, I want you to, to uh, achieve these escrow blessings, and so I have made certain provisions for you to be able to reach that. And the two provisions, again, require equal privilege and equal opportunity. Nobody has a head start. Nobody's ahead of anybody else. There can be nobody, just because you're a genius or a millionaire or because you're a very talented person, doesn't give you a leg up in, uh, uh, in front of anybody. You have equal privilege and equal opportunity. The equal privilege is the baptism of the Holy Spirit results in God placing you in the royal family. And everybody in the royal family is, has equal privilege Nobody is better off than anybody else. And the equal opportunity of predestination is that God has provided a divine dynasphere, the sphere of power, through which uh, resources you are able to achieve exactly what God desires for you. These two things make it possible for you to achieve what these things uh, are potential, uh, potentially yours. So now God has made it, uh, has put all of this together so that... Your, the primary assets uh, of uh, what he wants for you and how to get to what he wants, this is all uh, provided for you. Now here comes the plus. That is, here is the condition. This is what makes the difference. Do you want it? And that comes in whether or not you will utilize the secondary assets, the personnel assets, the unique assets which he has provided in his, the same source, sovereignty, love, and omniscience, provides these things so that you can achieve these things. None of this is meritorious. None of this has anything to do with ability, has nothing to do with intelligence, has nothing to do with uh, talent. It is all a matter of the people who are, uh, have equal privilege and equal opportunity utilizing free will and volition. Your, your volition... Uh, makes the choices. Production is whether you will utilize the filling of the Holy Spirit or not. Suffering, whether you will can be involved in mental attitude sins or accept it as from the hand of God, which is designed to push you on forward. Impact is whether you're seeking to have visible impact or whether you're going to utilize the invisible imp the, uh, the uh, impact of your own uh, ability or trust God. Personnel assets, the spiritual gifts that God has given you sovereignly to make it possible for you to uh, serve Him. And the unique assets are the indwelling of God the Father, the indwelling of God the Son, and the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. This which God has provided, plus this which you respond with as far as your volition, will equal this. Now I found a tremendous illustration. It, it's not in, from this dispensation, but it is an, an outstanding illustration. And if you take your Bible, please, and turn to 1 Kings, I want to show it to you. So this may be something you may want to mark, because someday you'll be looking for it. I, I, I didn't know exactly where it was, but it came to me uh, overnight, and uh, I just had to find it, and if I really saw it, I found it again this morning. I knew just about where it had to be. All right, we, you remember that Saul and his dynasty was made king over uh, the nation. And uh, his son would have been, uh, following along, would have been Jonathan. But God re stopped the dynasty and removed the, ki the uh, leadership of the nation from Saul and gave it to David. David was followed to the reign by his son. He was followed by his son, 
Rehoboam. Now, in the 11th chapter of the book of Kings, you have the, uh, the account of the disappointment or the use of volition. See, David's key, everything that God had promised David, some are unconditional, and you will see how they, re, they in, as this chapter proceeds, how it, how it is unconditional. That is, uh, that uh, it didn't make any difference who it was. There would never cease to be reigning and ruling upon the throne uh, a, a member of the family of David. That's an unconditional covenant that God had promised. And the land which God promised them, that will be theirs. So what you'll notice... Uh, now King Solomon comes along. Here is the equal, uh, the, 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 and, and, and again, remember this is not the same dispensation, so it can't be exactly the same. But here is the, the uh, what I would say would be the equal privilege and equal opportunity for you. I mean, you're a member of the royal family of God, not the royal family of David. And you have equal privilege and equal opportunity. All that God asks of you is be positive toward doctrine, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All Solomon had to do was to be obedient to God, to be positive toward God. Now beginning in chapter 11, verse 1. King Solomon, however, look that little word, however. That's the but. That's that little adversative that comes in there, the wow adversative that stops everything and says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, what, what does that mean, however? Well, go back to chapter 10, verse 23. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. The whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Year after year, everyone who came brought a gift. They described some of the... And then some of the, 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 the accoutrements of his kingdom that are listed in verses 26 and following. Okay, okay. All of these things. However, or but, there's a but here. He used his volition in the wrong way. Notice, but King Solomon loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughters. In other words, he uh, married, loved many women. Verse 2, they were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, but, in other words, volition, free will and volition. God said, this is, however, what he determined to do. He was smarter than God. He knew more than God knew. And that's exactly why believers lose out at what God has for them. They always, they think they know more than God. Look, nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. And as he grew older, verse 4, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. So verse 6, Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. Now God raised up adversaries to discipline him, but he didn't learn the lesson. Now, verse 26 introduces us to another man who was not from David's dynasty. Not to be confused with Rehoboam, we are introduced to a man whose name is Jeroboam. And he is described for us in 1 Kings 11, 26. Jeroboam, the son of Nevat, rebelled against the king. We'll see more about that later. He was one of Solomon's officials, an Ephraimite. So he was from the tribe of Ephraim, from Zereda, and his mother was a widow. And here is the account of how he rebelled against the king, which is not uh, what I want to bring out to you. What I wanted to, however, is 
uh, he meets with the prophet Ahijah in verse 29. And the prophet Ahijah brings him a message from God. The same message that I'm virtually, sim similar message that I'm bringing to you as a member of the royal family today. And I want you to notice this, what he tells him. Skip down to verse 34. He says, I will not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hand. That's the, that's the grace blessing, you see. Grace by association. Solomon's association with his father David means that he's not going to lose. Uh, that I will not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hand. I have made him a ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David my servant, whom I chose and who observed my commands and statutes. I will take the kingdom from his son's hands and give you ten tribes. Now, please notice what God is saying I will do for you, Jeroboam. Jeroboam, I will give you... Uh, 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 I will take the kingdom of his son and give you ten tribes. I will give one tribe to his son so that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city which I chose to put in my name. There is the, the uh, uh, covenant the unchanging covenant. Now, verse 37, very important verse. However, as for you, I will take you. You will rule over all that your heart desires. You will be king over Israel. If, 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 verse 38, if there is that volition, if you do whatever I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and commandments as David my servant. I will be with you. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David. Now, not many people realize that. We don't talk about We talk about how wonderful David was. We don't stop to think of what God said uh, could be Jeroboam. Jeroboam was not even from the tribe of Judah. He was not from David's line. He was an Ephraimite. And yet God said, listen, I'll give you everything your heart desires and more. I'll build a, di a dynasty for you like I did for David. How? We have no idea how God could have done it. But God could have done it because he promised it. And I will humble David's servants uh, uh, because of this. All he had to do was to go positive, and God would have done for him beyond belief. Now, you and I know the story because we've read the book, <laughs> and the end comes out. He did not go positive. What did he do? He said, I'll build two altars, and he built one in Beersheba, one in Dan, and there he built, he took two calves, and he said, these calves represent Yahweh, your God, come and worship here. And from that point on, uh, it is, uh, he goes down in, not in history, but in infamy. He goes down as the, uh, uh, they, uh, from after this, dynasty after dynasty after dynasty will come along in the northern kingdom, and you will see they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, as did Jeroboam, the son of Nevat. There, I, I couldn't believe it as it just moved into place, this fantastic passage. I couldn't believe it. If you will do what's right in my ways, I'll, you'll rule over everything your heart desires. I'll build you a I'll build you a dynasty like David's. You see, David got his by grace, unearned and undeserved. Jeroboam would have gotten his by grace, unearned and undeserved. It was potential right here and now. The potential stands. And it stands recorded. This is the, this is the tombstone uh, of history here for the northern kingdom. The epitaph written on the, king, on the tombstone for the northern kingdom. And beloved, that same thing could be written on the tombstone of multitudes of believers okay, if the truth were known. That is, you will rule over everything your heart desires. 
I will build a dynasty for you as enduring as I have for any of the greatest of any of my saints. There, it's all for you. Why? Because it's all done on the basis of God's fantastic privilege, equal privilege, equal opportunity for every believer, but dependent upon whether or not the, that believer will respond to the grace of God and to the and stick with what's really important in life. This great illustration of opportunity lost stands in Scripture to call attention to every believer on what could be yours. It will make the right priority. It's not singing in the choir. It's not teaching a class, driving a bus. It's not having a youth group to play footsie around some It's not where you have a pretty nursery. It's how senior churches. It's by doctrine that the importance. Word God. You place the number one priority in your life as the Word of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things. He yeah. adds. All right, now let's go back and look at some uh, categorical form at the new things, the two parts of the prior asset ability. I want you to note something I'm about predestination. Let me say again, those who just tuned in, those not seen before, the doctrine of the election and election have nothing to do with salvation. Don't fall into the trap of Calvinists who put there that it's fallacious, he's come from the philosophy, and it's wrong. You cannot say that because God destined believers to a certain thing, and he predestined unbelievers to a certain thing. It's fallacious reasoning, and it doesn't stand up in any kind of logical reasoning form. But we use it on. Just remember, the difference between election and predestination is the predictions of the sovereignty of God, all actions of the sovereignty of God which took place in eternity past. This expresses his will, predestination uh, expresses his provision. That's what you must remember of the difference. God has a will for every believer, a will, a purpose, a design. We use the word plan. God has a plan for your life. And for you to fill that, he had a provision. So let's begin with the nature of election. Of election. Also, in the book entitled Nations, this will be out as a matter of fact. Uh, we now have uh, 75 pages in it, and we do 100 for a volume because of how many verses it covers, but one will cover verses one too many to forget to. And by two will go on there so they get big, but we have too long to get them. It is so good to have to wait for the Word of God to be put into the language you can understand. It does do you while it sits in our computer. It does do you as well. It's in my own. It has to get into your soul and into your soul. Get it in the We sit that way. We'll have these books up as quick as we can. But if you want more information, just wait for the book. time you see this, this book will be pretty well too. Yeah, we're listening to anything true of you. First of all, then, the next one, the purpose of creation to describe the way that God provides invisible assets so that each believer, regardless of his background, regardless of his belief, each believer can fulfill the plan of God for his life. And in so doing, fulfilling the plan of God for his life has the, the greatest possible happiness in this life. The greatest possible blessing, the greatest possible fulfillment, satisfaction, contentment, all these things God wants you to have. He is designed that way. Point two. The equal, uh, the equal privilege of election is the universal priesthood of every believer. Now what is a priest? Well, a priest is a human being who represents people to God. Since we are living in the church age and every believer is a priest, this means that each person represents himself before God. You are a person and you represent yourself before the God of heaven. This reflects the privacy that God has ordained for every believer to live his life as unto the Lord, but it also reflects 
the responsibility that each one has to live his life as unto the Lord. This means you are responsible for every thought that you will uh, entertain, uh, every uh, action, every decision that you will make, you are responsible yourself. Since you are a priest and you do represent yourself and you do have privacy, you do have the responsibility. And responsibility comes from the word response. What does that mean? Well, again, uh, if God says that you are free to live your life in such a way, then God says your response is noted before me. And your re every thought, every action that you or this decision you have, you are accountable for that, for your decision. Now, what does it mean to be a universal priest, to represent yourself to God? Well, it simply means this, that, first of all, you offer your own prayers. You don't need anybody else to pray for you. You don't need anyone to represent you in prayer. But in addition to that, it also means that you as a person have the privacy and the, and the responsibility to evaluate yourself before God. You evaluate yourself consistently before God under this equal privilege portion of uh, an equal responsibility portion of uh, election. Now, this also uh, relates to the fact that you have equal privilege for learning what is the plan of God that he wants you to execute. Now, when we talk about learning the plan of God or doing the plan of God, let me hasten to say this. As soon as we think about that, everybody wants to know about some vocation that they should fulfill. What vocation am I supposed to fulfill? To fulfill the plan of God for my life, am I supposed to be a missionary or a pastor or what? This is not, this is an invisible asset. It's not what you do with your with me, how many cars you have in the day, where you punch a clock, that's not what God's talking about. That's a result. That's fine. It doesn't even count. What you do with your 24-hour days will result from whether or not you're learning to, to function and complete the plan of God for your life. And you learn what the plan of God is by means of studying the Word of God. And the more word of the more the more of the word you have, the more you understand his purpose, his plan. And what is the ultimate purpose, the ultimate plan that God has? That God should be glorified in your life, whether by life or by death. That your life should become a window through which the glory of God may be seen. And that's the whole reason you're here. You don't have any other reason for existence. Now, God gives you a lot of leeway in deciding how is the best way that I can become that window through whom the glory of God, or through which the glory of God may be seen. And so the, the believer learns the plan of God, and part of the plan of God, the learning process, is the gift of pastor-teacher, somebody who is your right pastor, who teaches you what the plan of God is from the source of categorical Bible doctrine in your life. Once you have learned doctrine, you learn, you evaluate yourself regarding whether or not you measure up to that particular doctrine that is taught. And you take care of the important things, and God takes care of the unimportant things. And the unimportant thing is to put you in some geographical location wherever that place may be. Now, most of us, if you're like me, 
You want to know where is the geographical place you want me rather than what is the spiritual place you want me. And if we all... I, I'd always want to know where I ought to be here. And that's God says, I'll take care of that. Forget about it. That's a rebuke to me consistently. Forget about that. And I'm talking, I mean, here I am in this church 24 years, and you can you imagine the kind of a person, am I where I ought to be, Lord? Should I, I, God is telling me for 24 years, forget about it. Be what I'm calling you to be. And I'll put you where I want to put you. And where I put you is there. And when I want you out, you'll be out. For goodness sake, leave it with me. Why can't I learn that? Because I'm so stupid. I'm so slow. I'm so stubborn. It's great, you know, when you can just forget about that and concentrate on the important thing. And I have learned one thing down through the years. When I become discouraged because things aren't going as I thought they should go, my recourse is run to my study and study harder. That's exactly what I do. I study harder. I study harder. I study longer. I study longer. I get into the study because I know that it's the Word of God that's alive and powerful. It's the Word of God that uh, sustains me. It's the Word of God that straightens out my, my thinking. It's the Word of God that rebukes me and scares me away. So that I am finally, I finally come to the place where I say, Well, Lord, uh, I leave it with you. And when, I, when that happens, invariably, and I should have learned this, but I'm so stupid, it takes me, I relearn it all the time. I should have learned long ago that when I say, Lord, it's up to you, then God works. But in the meantime, while I'm fighting Him, while I'm fighting through this thing, say, Well, I want to do that. I, uh, God says, I'm not doing a single thing until you're ready to leave it with me. As long as you're going to fight me with today, uh, I want to tell you a thing, I'm going to win. God's never lost yet, you know that? And how stupid it is for us to think we fight him. Listen, Lord, I, what does tomorrow bring? I don't really have the slightest idea. But I know one thing. If it's under grace, under the, the great dire for me and my assets, it can't be anything but the best. Why am I not content just to live? And work on that I work on. And that is to grow spiritually. We're so much in great that the way of me thinks that that's the way you have to do it. But we learn doctrine, we learn more of the plan, we learn more of these things. And so we can define our own lives on the basis of, the basis of doctrine, on the basis of the, the plan of God. And the royal priests is what we are. Uh, uh, we are royal priests. Uh, the royal priests... Uh, self-improvement is always based, and I use the word self uh, advisedly, that any improvement in your life is based upon the believer's comprehension of and assimilation and application of Bible doctrine. I call it the metabolization of Bible doctrine. You see, that's what's important. Now let me say something about that because there are people who don't understand one principle. I don't preach sermons for a, for, for a reason. If you know what sermonology is, you <laughs> the study of sermons, that is, the pastor generally determines what the congregation has need of, then he goes to the Scripture to find something that he can apply to that congregation so that he can meet the need of that congregation. The weakness there, the problem is, that no pastor is omniscient. He can't know what the real needs of the congregation are. Therefore, he better do a lot of visitation. Why? to find out what's going on in the privacy of the priesthood. But if the, private, if the priesthood has privacy, it's none of the pastor's business what's going on in their lives personally. But it is God's business. And therefore, the pastor's job is to just teach through the Bible. And believe it or not, God always meets needs according to 
the Word of God. Week after week, year after year, it's amazing how people will say, uh, uh, you know, I, I came and that message just uh, met a need that I had in my life. And I, I had no idea. I didn't preach a message. I don't preach messages. I just teach the Word of God uh, word by word, verse by verse, and categorically. And if you don't need it today, I guarantee something. You'll need it tomorrow or next week. Somewhere along the line, you're going to need this teaching about equal privilege and equal opportunity. But, therefore, it is the, not only the believer's right, uh, but it is also his responsibility to assemble with other believers, to learn doctrine from his own right pastor, taught in a group, so that your privacy can be respected. See, that's why, that's why discussion is not God's way. God didn't say, go into all the world and discuss the gospel. He said, preach the gospel, proclaim the gospel. He didn't, there's nowhere in the Word of God where he says to discuss the truth. Now, discussion always feels good for those who are involved in discussion because they have a chance to contribute. But discussion is also the expression of fantastic arrogance as people seek to utilize those discussion at times to call attention to themselves. Either their aberrant behavior in which everyone says, oh, and they sit there saying, well, I'm finally noticed. <laughs> they don't care if it's good or bad. They just want to be noticed. To the time when they throw in, their, they contribute their ignorance to a subject that they know nothing about, and uh, they think that that's contributing to what God says. Listen, when God says something, He doesn't need your opinion or mine added to it. It's there. That's why the, it says, Thus saith the Lord, period. And the other danger is to become arrogant and want to apply Bible doctrine to someone else's experience. That is none of your business. Now, you may look at somebody and say, they are out of line. Did I, do I have to tell you something? God knew it before you did. You may or may not be right. God is always right. And if he knows what is out of line in the person's life, he does not need you to apply doctrine to their life. Now, nobody in this or any other congregation is perfect. And God doesn't need you to sit out here or you to sit on the other side of the camera or you to sit, here, sit on the other side of your radio and to hear doctrine and say, Boy, this is just what Charlie Brown needs because it's not your business to say what Charlie Brown needs. That's between Charlie Brown and God. And God will take care of that. You apply doctrine to your life and allow every believer priest the equal privilege of living their life as unto the Lord without interference from other believers. Now, if I am living with equal privilege before the Lord, I have the privilege, same privilege you have of rebound but I have the same privilege you have of using it when I'm ready to. And sometimes I'm stupid and stubborn and I'm not ready when you are. I'm faster than you are, slower than you are. But we leave that with the Lord. I have a consistent prayer life. The application of doctrine experience. Worship. Worship which comes from my own soul. Not on the basis of soft lights or soft music or so forth. The sacrifice of praise which, praise, which is the believer's doctrinal momentum resulting in spiritual adulthood. Self-motivation from metabolization of Bible doctrine. And remember this. The pastor isn't the leader of anyone's social life. 
nor the madam of a lonely hearts club, nor a counselor, nor a crutch. And may, by, by way of extension, give a warning to you who are teachers. It is always a temptation on the part of the teacher to become arrogant and start to try to live the lives of those whom we are teaching. We are here to teach the truth. But God the Holy Spirit is responsible to work in the life of the child. We cannot do it. That's the weakness with 99 and 44, 100 percent of all youth programs. The youth programs are designed to let, to, for someone else to assume responsibility for their own lives. Why? What, what happens? The youth group starts to plan social events. Listen. That's any person who grows up as a teenager and does not have the ability to plan his own or her own social life is a social misfit. And is, the worst thing you can do for them is to teach them uh, how to do it by doing it for them. You don't help anybody by doing something for them that they should be doing for themselves. Now, it's one thing to encourage. It's one thing to teach how, but it's another thing to do for them what they should be doing themselves. And youth groups all over the country are becoming social organizations, uh, social leaders, in which the leadership plans the social life of a person who is uh, just because he's a teenager doesn't mean he's any less of a person. If they're a person, they have, should plan their own social life. Why do I have to plan it for them? If they're socially a misfit, then I need to teach them how not to be a social misfit. And I teach them Bible doctrine. How do you have friends? You must be friendly. The Bible tells you exactly how to be a friend. Have love. How do you have love? Let the Holy Spirit produce it for you in your life. How do I find... The, uh, the, the right kind of a guy or the right kind of a gal for my life as a uh, uh, if I'm on the prowl as they say by having someone be the matchmaker oh a garbanzo has from time to time pretended to have the uh, garbanzo grande lonely hearts club but uh, he's never been successful uh, which is why it's so, fun, so much fun whenever he sets out to uh, set the, put the, uh, the right person with the other right person, it always ends up a disaster, which is what it's supposed to be. See, uh, I was talking to uh, a gal lady that swims with me, and she said, well, my, my daughter is on her third husband. And uh, she said, I sure wish she'd meet the right guy. And I said, where is she looking? I'm going to tell you, she's not going to find the right guy down at the singles bar. I guarantee you that. There is a right place to find the right guy. And that's the will of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and let God provide the right guy at the right time. Don't get hot pants. You move on the basis of your hot pants and you end up from frying pan into fire. Then you'll rule the day. Equal privilege says, look, I recognize I am a priest before God and I am responsible for my life before God. Now, when they, as we're teaching them and training them as they're coming uh, along, we take them slowly, small increments, little by little, and teach them and train them. And with, when they're young, of course, you, you have a birthday party for a, a small child. They can have their own birthday party. 
Well, by the time they're 12 or 13, they ought to be able to plan their own birthday party and not have it to be, you know, the wrong kind. They ought to be able to do it. If you've trained them right, most of the time, parents are too slow. I know. I'm guilty of that. We don't know when to cut the apron strings. We just have to hold on, and that's personal arrogance. Personal arrogance. Someone said to me one time, well, you tell me when is going to be the right age for you to cut the age string. Well, what, what, I had no answer. And the answer was it should have been four years ago. But I didn't. I was so arrogant as to think that my son couldn't do certain things without me. Yeah, what's, what I think, where was my concern? What's the truth of my concern? The concern was me, not him. I, I, I was thinking myself. I made up my concern was him. If my concern was for him, I'd prepare him. No. We love to kid ourselves. We lie to ourselves. We believe ourselves, folks. That's the worst part. We believe ourselves. Then when I made the move, I moved so drastically that I, I, I injured his spirit. I moved too suddenly. I should have been preparing him, preparing him, preparing him, preparing him, and so that now's the time. You're on your own. Instead of coddling, 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 and then suddenly, now you're on your own. I was wrong. I was wrong, very wrong. But see, that's arrogance. And it's easier from, behind, from hindsight than it is in foresight, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and I'm not criticizing you when I tell you that. I'm criticizing myself. But don't think that I'm here picking on you. I'm picking on me. Because I'm telling you the truth. The point is, you see, if every believer has this equal privilege, the equal privilege of the opportunity. Don't forget that. God says, with the privilege, I am going to give every divine provision for logistical, logistical support and thing. He studied the doctrine of logistics very recently, so I don't, you two who are listening or you what you want the doctrine, we have the whole book on what we about, we have to send the book on the doctrines of grace. But you aren't blessed because of who and what you are. Jeroboam, what did Jeroboam have that God should offer to him? Kingdom. Nothing. God said, it's your obvious. Here it is. Great. All you have to do is be blessed. But with me, a privilege comes equal opportunity. And God provides you, but he also provides it for any believer. And nobody deserves it. There you eat, food you eat, the clothes you wear, transportation, your employment, your health, everything. The very reason why is because of who and what God is. It's logistical grace. For which is a lot. It's opportunity. Everybody. And from the source of equal privilege and equal opportunity. Me then, kiss around and say, oh, woe was me. I lose God's fault. I didn't get the chance that he gave to John D. Robert. He didn't get the chance that he gave to you. He didn't give me the chance to get someone else. Wrong. God did give you the chance. He did give you the opportunity. It's all yours. Let's pray. I thank you, Father, for your matchless grace. Help apply this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's hard to see Vance seeing a mouse and to pray. <laughs> yeah, I went that way. Yeah. He found the whole place. Yeah, I came around the whole thing. So, well, what advanced that?